Hi everyone, Frank Cifaldi from the Video Game History Foundation here. This year we collaborated with the Game Developers Conference to build an interactive history exhibit called the Game History Gallery, which is on the Expo Hall floor from Wednesday through Friday during the show. Video game developers are our core audience when we're looking for physical donations of materials, so this was a pretty exciting opportunity for us. I'll have more to say about that later, but for now let's go on a brief tour. Something I've always enjoyed about GDC is the IGF Pavilion, where you can go play all of the nominees for the Independent Games Festival award show that happens during GDC on these classy stand-up kiosks with the name of the game on a marquee. The games tend to be really interesting and inspiring. It's where all the innovation and weird ideas happen. We were inspired to do something similar, except with games that, well, just happened to be old. We wanted to teach history, because that's our thing here, but at the same time, we wanted to inspire today's game developers by looking backwards. Uh, to me, this is what a GDC history exhibit should be. This year, we exhibited five playable games, and choosing them based on our criteria was kind of an interesting challenge. First, these games had to have individual creative voices behind them. Given that this is GDC, we wanted to put human faces on display next to the games they made. Second, we wanted attendees to see themselves in those faces, so we tried our best to exhibit creators from a range of different backgrounds and identities. Third, the games had to have interesting ideas, which might even be challenging to modern taste. Again, the goal was to spark creativity amongst the show's developer attendees. And finally, the games couldn't just be interesting, they had to be playable in an expo environment. So anything too complicated was out. They had to be games that you could just walk up and play at a kiosk. As we were whittling our list down, we realized we had a loose theme. All five of our titles were creatively directed by people who came from outside of traditional game development in one way or another. I'll go through them chronologically. The first game in our exhibit was Wabbit for the Atari VCS, or the 2600 if you prefer. We previously did a video about Wabbit and its author Von Mai, I'll put a link in the description below. Wabbit has the distinction of being the first game that we know of to star an on-screen human girl. Each of our kiosks also had a glass case where we tied artifacts both to the game itself and to the concept of why it was featured. So for Wabbit, we had a physical copy of the game, but we also featured other examples of what female representation was like at the time. If you wanted to play as a female character back then, your only choices were to be a little girl with flowers, an object of sexual desire, an animal, or a Miss Pac-Man. The next game in our lineup was Alter Ego, made by Dr. Peter Favreau for Activision. This game is a personal favorite of mine. Favreau is a forensic psychologist, and in the 80s he was interested in the use of technology as a therapeutic tool. So he made a game where people could live out alternate lives by making tough decisions without having to face any real consequences. Something I always liked about this game is that it actually shipped in separate male and female versions. I wanted to honor that by making sure attendees could play either one, so our custom joystick let you choose a male or female game by simply hitting a button. We had to write some custom Python scripts and mess with the emulator settings to make this feel seamless, but it worked wonderfully. We also worked with the author of the emulator we used, Mednafen, who provided a custom build that flipped the game's discs when prompted. This was really cool. This basically made an Apple II game that technically came on 12 disc sides just feel like a modern game. The case showed Favreau's personal shelf copies of his games, which he loaned us, along with a couple of the books he'd written. We put one about microcomputers next to one about child development, which I thought was neat because Alter Ego is pretty much those two books combined. We also showed some other games similar to Alter Ego, including more modern titles like The Sims and The Walking Dead. I don't know for sure if either took direct inspiration from Alter Ego, but they're definitely cut from the same cloth. Our next game was Where in North Dakota is Carmen Sandiego? another game that the VGHF had previously done some archival work on. In fact, very ironically, the full game was lost until I went to North Dakota to find it. I've linked to a blog post about this below. Believe it or not, this was a real Carmen Sandiego game. The Carmen team at Bruderbund took care of all the software development parts, the code and art and stuff like that, while a group of teachers in Minot, North Dakota, took care of all the, well, 
North Dakota stuff, the clues you have to solve, which effectively turn these public educators into game designers. We're lucky to house some artifacts related to the game and its development in Minot, and we exhibited them here. This retail box is incredibly rare. I only know of a handful still in existence. The next game in the gallery is SimTunes, which was designed by Japanese installation artist Toshio Iwai. This game has an interesting history. It actually started as an installation piece at the Exploratorium here in San Francisco. It was originally licensed by Nintendo and ported to the Super NES as a game called Sound Fantasy, but that version never made it to market. After that, it ended up with Maxis, who made the home computer version we exhibited. This was my favorite of our custom controllers. We gave it a trackball like the original Exploratorium exhibit had, and a joystick to move the camera around, essentially turning a mouse and keyboard game into an arcade cabinet. The case here exhibited EY's other commercial games, Otaki and Electroplankton. We also put in Kid Picks here as another example of a software toy, something that skirts the edge of what one might define as a video game. We also had a bit of fun with this vintage Japanese radio and a zoetrope, two devices that EY cited as influences for his interactive art. The final game was Puppet Motel, designed by recording artist Laurie Anderson and mixed media artist Sinchen Huang. We like this game as an example of the time in the mid-1990s when CD drives for computers were new, and there was this brief moment where interactive CD-ROM media, which may not have necessarily adhered to rules of what a video game are, might have been a new art form. They really embraced this and made an oddball experiential piece of software. We filled this case with other examples from this era, for better or worse. Some, like Anderson, tried to make a unique new work, while other recording artists were content to simply put their music videos on disc. I really like this exhibit in particular as a way of making you think about an alternate reality where on-screen interactive art wasn't dominated by gameplay rules. It's a reality that I'm not entirely convinced isn't coming someday. The interactive game kiosks weren't all we had. Dead center in the exhibit was a glass case that really represented what it is we wanted to say to GDC's attendees. It tied into a speech I gave on stage at the end of the Independent Games Festival awards ceremony. I'll link to that in the description as well, but basically our message this year was that the only way video game history is saved is if those who are a part of it curate their own stories and keep records of their work. I encourage people to go home and start putting their work in a box so historians like me could better understand them in the future. I think the message resonated because a lot of people came up to me throughout the rest of the show to say they were inspired to go home and start cataloging, which I loved hearing. This big glass case was our physical representation of the kinds of things we've already found in other people's boxes. I'd hoped it would inspire people to come up and say, oh, you're looking for this kind of thing? Uh, and I'm glad to report that quite a few people did exactly that. And then finally, as a way of accepting monetary donations toward the Video Game History Foundation, we had a kiosk set up where you could get souvenir photos printed from a real Game Boy camera. We created this for Portland Retro Gaming Expo a couple of years ago, and it's always a hit. The donations we got from this help us justify the time spent building and staffing the exhibit. Overall, I'd say we're pretty happy with how things turned out this year. If we do it again next year, we have a few things we want to tweak. I think the biggest one for me is that we didn't do a great job of messaging the theme with the games on display. I had a young person ask me if this was an exhibit of some of the most important video games in history, and I had to explain it was kind of the opposite. We actually have a pretty compelling theme in mind already if we're invited back that I hope I get to explore. The VGHF, by design, isn't likely to ever be a public museum, as we don't think that business is the right fit for us, but Phil and I have a lot of love and respect for teaching history through physical installations, so it's nice to be able to stretch our legs once in a while and challenge ourselves to create something cool like this. And I hope to maybe challenge other curators to think more about what a video game history exhibit can be. Maybe I'm an idealist, but I much prefer creating something more akin to an art gallery like this than, say, playing to retro game nostalgia. But I guess that's the beauty of doing little pop-ups like this as opposed to a more permanent installation. We don't have to rely on ticket sales, as our audience is already here. Anyway, that's all I've got. 
Thanks to everyone who came out, and to our volunteer Matthew Callis for flying all the way out from Seattle to help staff the booth. Until next time, this is Frank Cifaldi from the Video Game History Foundation, signing off.